Bom dia a todos. Agora, oficialmente, vamos começar o nosso programa da reunião de hoje. Teremos dois temas praticamente a ser abordados, que eles se misturam um pouco, né? FEC e SIX. Uh, SIX é uma técnica, não vou dizer que é nova, mas acho que é uma técnica pouco difundida ainda aqui no Brasil, e por isso acho muito interessante que hoje a gente consiga abordar esse tema. E para isso, uh, teremos dois uh, grandes especialistas nessa técnica, o doutor Surab uhum. e o doutor uh, Deepak. E justamente em respeito a nossos convidados que já estão aqui, uh, inclusive essa primeira parte da reunião, nós vamos mudar um pouquinho para o inglês. Por favor, fiquem à vontade para interromper em qualquer momento e fazer qualquer pergunta ou comentário, tanto em português quanto em inglês. Ok, pessoal? So, uh, for this first part of our meeting, we'll start with a paper presentation from our fellow Alini, please. So, hello, my name is Alini, I'm a fellow at the service uh, this year, and I'm going to present the article today. Uh, the article is about uh, meta-analysis to compare the safety and efficacy uh, of manual small incision cataract surgery and phacomacification. It was published in this Middle East African Journal uh, on September 2015. The, the authors declared no conflict of interest. So uh, we know that cataract is an unpredictable cause of blindness, especially as a special factor uh, when you have a backlog of patients and when you don't have uh, an eye care resources or trained surgeons to do. So one of the types of the surgery uh, you can do in this kind of situation uh, is the manual small incision cataract surgery. And what is that? Uh, it's a type of uh, extra capsular uh, cataract extraction. So mainly we have three types of incision. We have the coinolim incision that we can do, but uh, it can uh, deliver high astigmatism. We have the sclerotunnel uh, to diminish the high astigmatism that the corneal incision uh, can do. And we have the, the M6, because uh, it's a bigger incision inside the eye, a smaller incision uh, outside the eye, so uh, it can be done without any suture, and also it can uh, diminish the astigmatism. So the question here is, uh, is FACO, FACO massification better than M6? Uh, the outcomes that uh, the meta-analysis uh, compared is the uncorrected visual acuity and corrected visual acuity uh, at the 2-20-60 cutoff, that's the normal uh, vision in most countries, 20-30 uh, 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 for driver's license and 2-20-200 for economic blindness. Also, they compared uh, astigmatism, intra-op and post-op complications, endothelial cell loss, uh, duration, um, cost of the surgery, and learning curve. For interop complications, they um, included endothelial cell loss, posterior uh, capsular rupture, vitreous loss, zonal dialysis, iridodialysis, and for post-op complications, and of tomitis, uh, retinal detachment, posterior capsular op opacification, and post-op edema. Uh, they researched in three in these uh, three databases. Uh, they uh, found 84 studies uh, in these uh, databases, and the level ones uh, compared uh, directly uh, six versus phacomacification. Uh, six of them were uh, randomized control trials, and five a direct comparison, with a total of um, seventy thousand and six. Uh, 76,000 uh, surgeries, but uh, there was these two uh, articles. So the first one uh, talks about the learning curve and learning performance um, in residents and uh, of our residents and fellows, and has a larger number. And the last one here uh, compares both when they talk about high volume uh, settings. So uh, because of that, they didn't uh, include it in the meta-analysis, but they discussed in parallel. Uh, so uh, with this total of uh, 76,000 surgeries, uh, excluding these two articles, uh, we have 1,760 uh, surgeries. 
for statistical analysis. They included randomized control trials and parallel arms. Uh, and the primary outcomes were either binary or continuous variables. So for the results, uh, comparing the best corrected visual acuity at the 2060 uh, cutoff, they saw that there is no statistical difference between them. So the proportion of patients in each technique group uh, of uh, that reached the better visual equity uh, didn't uh, have a statistical difference. Uh, comparing the uncorrected visual equity also, um, they didn't find any difference uh, between the, these two techniques. Uh, compared the best corrected visual acuity at the 2030 uh, cutoff. Also, with, the, uh, with no uh, statistical difference, they didn't find. But uh, when you talk about uh, uncorrected visual acuity, they found a, a better uh, visual acuity uh, favoring the FACO misification. And uh, when you talk about astigmatism, uh, also they did they did find a a, a difference uh, favoring phacal massification. It can be related to the uncorrected visual acuity that uh, also favors uh, phaco. For intraop complications, excluding those two studies that we saw earlier. Uh, also, they didn't find any difference between these two uh, techniques. Uh, including only the last, uh, last article with the high volume settings and also with no difference uh, between uh, these two groups, uh, including both articles as well, uh, with no difference uh, between these two techniques. So interop in general uh, with no difference between them. Uh, with post-op complications, excluding those two articles, uh, they didn't find a statistical difference, uh, including only the high volume one, excluding the learning curve uh, one. Didn't find a statistical difference, maybe a tendency for uh, favoring sticks, but uh, with no difference uh, they found. And when you include both studies uh, in this type, they saw um, a better proportion of the patients favoring the six group. So it uh, can be related to the learning curve that was included here. Uh, when they talk about endothelial cell loss, didn't find a, a statistical difference between them. And uh, talking about the duration of each technique, and they couldn't they couldn't uh, do a meta-analysis because the articles didn't report the standard deviation uh, of each technique, but we can see here that's pretty much similar um, each, uh, each technique, the duration. And here uh, we can see the cost comparison between these two techniques. And FACO massification, it's uh, like the double cost of six in general. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, they didn't see a difference uh, when you talk about best corrected visual acuity, intra-op and post-talk complications. Maybe uh, when you talk about learning complications, it can be uh, best to do the M6 uh, surgery, endothelial loss. FACO is better when you, do, when you talk about the uncorrected visual acuity and astigmatism. And six uh, is a good technique when, it, when you have a situation that you don't have uh, such resources, uh, countries with large backlogs, and an experienced uh, surgeon, because uh, the learning curve of sticks is uh, smaller than the fake classification. For discussion, let's remind that uh, in this meta-analysis, uh, there were few studies included, with fewer comparing each outcome. So we have to think about that. Also, uh, they included some specific cataracts, some articles that compared to specific cataracts. So there's this one comparing subluxated and the third one immature cataracts. So uh, with that in mind, I, I want to uh, ask the speakers here, uh, which technique do, uh, do you prefer if uh, FACO or M6 regarding the cataracts or in a high volume set, uh, settings or mainly in the overall cost of uh, each surgery? 
and uh, that's that's what I came to tell you guys. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Alini. And before we start our comments, I'd like to properly introduce uh, Dr. Surab uh, and thank him again for his participation. Dr. Surab is an Indian uh, colleague. As he works as a consultant at Nanda Deep Eye Hospital in India, and he's the fellowship director uh, in that hospital as well. He's a renowned uh, surgeon. Um, virtual uh, groups, or okay, that's where uh, I could uh, be in touch with him, and it's an honor to have you here today. And for those who don't know, I'd like also to spread the word. There is a Telegram group called uh, Ocular Surgery Worldwide that uh, unites many uh, ophthalmic surgeons around the world. And it's plenty of knowledge and tips for everyone who wants to join it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Neto is part of it, uh, as well as Dr. Surab. They are very active members in that uh, group. And Dr. Surab also holds a YouTube channel where he explains uh, many techniques and gives many FACO tips as well. So, uh, Dr. Surab, thank you once again. And now open to comments. Alini has pointed out some, uh, I believe, at least controversial uh, topics for discussion because some of them in this meta-analysis uh, are compared between FACO and SICS, but when it comes to each specific outcome, you see there is a limitation in the studies analyzed. And also this dates to 2015. I don't believe there has been such a great improvement over the last five years for any of uh, these techniques. But maybe the studies included are a little bit uh, older as well. But I'd like to hear experiences from our guests and please Feel free to comment. Sure. Uh, I think that it was an excellent paper. And uh, I think most of the papers were from India, if I, I was, uh, if I'm not wrong. And that's because uh, SICS is being practiced uh, predominantly in uh, India. Uh, it's a great surgery. And what uh, this meta-analysis tells us is that SICS, SICS is a good, dependable uh, technique for cataract extraction. And it is as safe as uh, PECO or ECC. And as you rightly said, uh, the decision making uh, can cannot be completely based on a study. Okay, what the study tells us is that it's good. You can use it. It's not worse than uh, FECO, so you can use it. But you have to individualize it. So for an individual eye, we have to decide whether uh, a FACO is a better technique for that eye or SICS is a better technique for that eye. Uh, if we remove, uh, you know, the resources uh, restrictions, because SICS, as uh, rightly mentioned in the paper, is the less, least expensive of the surgeries. Uh, you don't require, you know, a lot of resources to start. That's the great point. Uh, but if you see the uh, learning curve, I think it was mentioned that SICS has a, a shorter learning curve. Uh, I would not agree with that completely. Uh, if you compare the results in terms of refractive and clinical outcomes of FACO uh, from a, you know someone learning FACO and someone learning SICS, to match the same kind of uh, you know refractive and clinical outcomes, SICS you need to do many more surgeries to refine that art. And uh, what I see when I train my fellows is that uh, FACO is more technique dependent. It's like you know engineering, while SICS is more like you know art. So you can uh, teach a uh, you know fellow a technique much easier than a art. So for learning the art, the surgeon has to also interpret few things. For example, simple as clever tunnel. I can tell few things how to do it, but ultimately it is the particular trainee or the fellow. He has to understand the depth and feel of the tissue that I cannot teach. For FACO, it's much more easier. That's what I feel as a trainer. So I think uh, 
many of you are also in training they can also comment on this part also uh i that's one of the points i had to uh comment as well because when you say the learning curve is uh not so steep i, I agree with dr surab because uh lastly we've tried some uh sics with residents and it, it's it's not uh it's not an easy, an easy surgery to perform, especially when you aim at such high standards as we have today for uncorrected visual acuity and uh, astigmatism induction. So that's an excellent uh, comment. Uh, I will move on for the next uh, presentation that's on extra cap. And here I'd like to make some interaction with our uh, attendees because um, Gabriel is our fellow and he will present some videos, but that's, um, that's to illustrate some of the steps on both ECCE and uh, SICS. Uh, this is specific part we aimed at ECCE, that's extra capsular uh, cataract extraction, because I think most Brazilians are more familiar with it than SICS. So Gabriel, if you could share your screen, please. And I'll make some polls so everyone can answer and we'll see if which, which techniques uh, you prefer, okay? Hi, my, my name is Gabriel. I'm following the surgical optic service of Scala Paulista. And uh, this part of the, the presentation is about, uh, we are going to talk about the extracapsular cataract extraction. Uh, as Felipe said, uh, during the presentation, I will show you some videos of surgeries of our service, just to illustrate each step of the surgery. So first, uh, I would like to thank the residents of our service and my colleague, Dr. Marília, who provides their videos to this presentation. And I would like to invite participants to respond to their preference in the polls that we will launch during the presentation. The First step uh, is about the incision. So I want to ask Neto and the other uh, guests, uh, what's the preference incision, the, the, if corneal incision, limbus incision, or scleral tunnel? And uh, if scleral tunnel, how far from the limbus? And uh, what's the width of the incision? And uh, I want to ask if, if, is there any change in the routine of uh, if the ECC is planned, or if it is a converted FACO emulsification. Dr. Would you Neto. like to comment on that, Dr. Neto? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I I mostly perform uh, uh, SICS when I need it, and uh, I prefer a more a scleral tunnel, a frown incision. Not so much. I think that one of the things that uh, makes it difficult to do six is to make a a, a too much frowned incision, but, and, but I use it, uh, it very, um, um, let's say, rarely. I think I perform some five to six SIS, I, SICS uh, surgeries per month. Uh, but all, I, I prefer, I strongly prefer to do SICS uh, than ECC. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, if he is clear of tunnel, or what's the format of the incision too? I don't know if you want, you said that you prefer as Yes, the frown incision is my preferred one. Mm -hmm. So uh, here I think I would like to comment on the incision type. Uh, when you begin with, uh, you start with the straight incision. And as you go on uh, becoming more uh, com uh, complete with your surgical skills, then you can go on to frown and uh, chevron incision. I think that's the best way to go about. And uh, about the capsulotomy, uh, what's your preferred capsulotomy? Is it a can opener capsulotomy, a continuous curvilinear uh, capsular axis, or envelope uh, capsulotomy, or a V? And if a CCC, what's the size of the continuous capsular axis? And uh, if you add a uh, relaxed incisions, if you have CCC. Just a moment, uh, Gabriel, so, so we can share our results. 
uh, most of the attendees do not uh, perform uh, ECC or SICS on a regular basis. And most of them use a sclerotono with a smile incision. Uh, I think that's expected from what we see here, at least in, in Brazil. So let's move on. Uh, I'll launch the next poll, please answer. Uh, the Dr. Nat or Dr. Saru? Oh, yes, I think it depends on the, as I, I, I almost, uh, uh, I often do SICS when the, there is an indication, let's say, for example, Luzonius or an extremely hard cataract or uh, for some other reason, the type of capsulotomy will sometimes depend from, uh, of that. For example, if you have a, an extremely fibrotic anterior capsule associated with a very hard cataract, so uh, most of the time you will have to resort to uh, a kind of canopic capsulotomy or scissor or, or with scissors or micro scissors. But whenever possible, I try to do a CCC. And if the, if the nucleus is big, I try to do the CCC as big as possible. So I don't get, uh, I don't get, uh, I don't have trouble uh, prolapsing the nucleus out of the capsular bag. Uh, yeah, uh, I think CCC is the best way to go about, uh, as Dr. Nito already pointed out. In difficult cases, uh, you sometimes have to resort to can opener or a CCC with uh, some radial cuts or even envelope for liquefied cortex and all. But I think if you can uh, go for CCC and if required, you can enlarge it later. That works the best. Uh, and regarding the size, I think uh, the most important rather than the technique is the opening of the uh, capsule and the size. I will talk about it in my lecture as well. So what it should be, that's more important for doing a, a small incision cataract surgery. Uh, here are the results. So we can see the major prefer uh, CCC and uh, they don't re uh, add a relaxed incision. Uh, and about the hydro dissection, what's your opinion? It's indicated or not? It depends of the the nucleus. I think it it, it uh, mostly depends of the nucleus. If it's a very hard nucleus, there is no need to to hydro dissect. If you have to do um, a, a, let's say, if you're not able to do a CCC. I think it's preferable not to hydro dissect for risk of uh, enlarging or having a radial tear. So uh, if, the, if the indication, for example, of the SICS is loose on us and the nucleus is not hard, it's very important to do hydro dissection. So it will vary according to the situation you're facing. Yes, uh, that's a, at least some controversial point here because uh, in Brazil there are many uh, people that defend not to do it and because it wouldn't be safe uh, because you cannot control uh, where the fluid is, is, is going. Most times you don't have the visibility because uh, these kind of surgeries are usually indicated in, in uh, harder cataracts. So that's why we, we launched this question. I think Surab is keeping his secrets for his presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to, yeah, because we are doing a small, uh, we are making a very large incision yeah. here. So the hydro dissection is quite different from what we do in PECO. So we have generally what, I, when I prefer to do hydro dissection is after making the tunnel complete, making the entry. So the anterior chamber is almost open. So hydro dissection is quite safe. Usually it will, lead to nucleus prolapse and uh, will not lead to tear down to the posterior capsule because whatever fluid you are pushing in, it is trying to come out through the open incision. So it's quite safe to do uh, hydro dissection even if you have done capsulotomy. Uh, another step is about the prolapse of the nucleus. Uh, in my opinion, it's uh, one of the most the steps more difficult in the learning curve. So I want to ask, uh, how do you perform a nucleus prolapse? And uh, if you, you have, is there any tip who, who is learning what you have said about this? 
Dr. Net, do you prefer uh, OVD posterior? Yes, nucleus? I think uh, 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 most of the time I rotate the nucleus. I I usually use some of G to to start the the uh, some part the, the the proximal part of the nucleus to be prolapsed and then continue rotating the nucleus. I think you have great control doing that doing it that way. I think it depends on the hardness of the cataract. If it is soft cataract, uh, hydroprolapse is the easiest and uh, best one to do. Harder the cataract, you can do rotate and uh, use a kind of blunt instrument to pick it up. Uh, other steps about the, the liver of the nucleus, now. what's your preference? Uh, if you use a lens loop or a irrigating practice and uh, other option is a disco expression or use two instruments and do like a FACO sandwich or another instrument, there is some uh, instruments like a fish hook or other kind of instrument. I, I, I feel more comfortable doing visco expression, but um, I, I sometimes use a, a irrigating vectix. It depends on, sometimes you feel that you have made the tunnel uh, not large enough and you have to extend it. And so uh, many times you combine techniques. I really would like to hear from Surab what is his uh, what technique he feels is the, the best or a safer one, in most cases at least? So let's see, I think maybe during my uh, talk uh, and also Dr. Deepak will be joining us. Well, most of us use a lens loop or vectors. I believe that's the most common practice in Brazil, uh, at least for uh, ACC. For the last, Dr. Neto, about the shooters, uh, what's your uh, preferred shooter? If you prefer a simple interrupted uh, shooter or a continual shooter or other kind like uh, show lasses? And if I'm able to do SICS, um, uh, there is very, very little need for suture. Sometimes you don't need to do any suturing, but I, I, I almost do. And at least uh, an X, an X mattress, mattress a suture in the middle, I do. Sometimes I suture all the way up in, X mat, in an X mattress uh, suture way. Sometimes getting three, three passes and making it like an, a, a double X. But I like to close the sutures. I, I, I do not feel comfortable to leave the, the tunnel or the incision opening, uh, open. Even when the tunnel is very, is a, a very sclero and in frown, and I, 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 I'm afraid to leave it open. I think that's because I do very little. I, I'm sure Surab does surgery and no, and, and uh, as uh, uh, expert surgeons, tunnel are perfect. Uh, it's amazing to see how they seal and are very safe and induce. Practically no astigmatism, you can live without suturing. That's great. Uh, this first part, uh, our intention was to like uh, survey the, the attendants for what are their preferred practices. And I believe uh, it's, it's somewhat uh, expected from at least what we see uh, around here in, in Southeast uh, Brazil. Uh, so, and by the way, I didn't, uh, we were already talking um, before, but Dr. Neto, I thank you for your uh, participation in this meeting as well. And Dr. Neto, for those who don't know, he is like such a, a close guest to us that uh, I, I forgot to introduce him properly, but he is uh, called the, the Faco wizard or <laughs> the, the uh, magician in what he can do. And as Surab was talking before uh, about art and uh, like, engi like an engineer, uh, I believe Dr. Neto is more about art in performing his uh, surgeries. And for those who don't uh, know, he has a YouTube channel as well. You can check it out and learn a lot from it. 
So, Dr. Neto, thank you once again for your participation yeah. as well. Thank you and for the kind words, Philippe. <laughs> I want to and thank you. we'll move on to Dr. Surab's uh, talk. He has held much of his comments, I believe, for this for this presentation, and now he'll um, uh, he'll disclose what he's uh, able to to perform in SICS and. I once again thanks uh, thank for the opportunity to share uh, pearls and tips on such a beautiful technique as IC SICS, and I hope it will help uh, Brazilians to understand it better. So, Dr. Surab, if you can uh, share your screen, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Felipe, and uh, very kind of you to invite me for this uh, excellent uh, meeting. Uh, so I will start off with uh, one PowerPoint presentation that I prepared yesterday. And let's see, we'll start with that. And as we go on, I will share a few videos also with you. So let's start with uh, my presentation on manual SICS. Uh, uh, it was very nice to start the meeting with some study and a uh, lot of uh, uh, polls, I think that uh, cleared a lot of doubts also, and also gave us a, you know, kind of, uh, we know now what people prefer, which technique people prefer. So let's start with the manual SICS. Now it's a misnomer. It's not a small incision cataract surgery. In fact, it is a large incision cataract surgery, but it is, good thing is that it, you can leave it without a suture. So what is the difference between ECC that uh, generally we start learning and then we move on to SICS. So what are the principal differences? So it is the method of delivery here. So when the word delivery comes, what we remember is the delivery, this one. So ECC is like, you know, caesarean section where the large opening is made and the baby is delivered out. Very easy, technically. And uh, small incision cataract surgery is like normal delivery where the baby has to go through different steps to come out. So ECC is a one-step procedure, I would say, and sutures are always needed because it's not a self-sealing incision that is done. Uh, definitely, it, it is uh, not that skill dependent, as we know. And uh, in fact, uh, even the those who are not experienced of doing any surgery, they can start off with ECC and uh, with a good supervisor, they can fairly finish the ECC. But it is an open globe procedure and that, uh, you know, that carries some risk associated with that. Now, small incisions cataract surgery is a two-step procedure. I will uh, explain the two steps here. And here, generally, sutures are not needed, as I, we explained. And uh, But definitely, it requires more skill and uh, the understanding of the tissue as compared to ECC. And it's a relatively close group procedure. If you have done the tunnel right, it is a close group procedure. And that's why it's safer than doing ECC. Now, what are the two steps in SIC? It's always for, if someone wants to learn something, I, th I think it is best to, you know, break it down into different steps as, you know, as many steps as possible so that uh, whenever you are, you know, doing a surgery and you have a difficult case in front of you, this is what my, uh, you know, mental technique is that I divide it into multiple steps and I focus only on completing the first step before going on to next. So that's the way you should do it for SICS also, if you are learning it. So the step one is the prolapse of the nucleus in the anterior chamber. So what are the challenges for this prolapse of the nucleus? One thing is anterior capsule. So we have already just discussed how we have to make the opening. I will detail, I will tell in detail again. And second is the pupil, which we should not uh, forget about. So these are the two things which may uh, you know, cause pr problem with the prolapse of the nucleus. And step two is this delivery of the nucleus through the scleral tunnel. And the challenges is, uh, of course, the making of a good scleral tunnel and 
we should not be damaging the endothelium during this process so these are the main challenges so i will just talk you through concept because you must have seen all the steps in different youtube videos and uh, you know the steps basically so let's you know think about the concepts behind a particular step once you understand the concepts i think we can tackle variety of cases because every cataract case will be slightly different so what are the challenges in nk capsule now i am talking about on the simple cases because complex cases like zonular weakness etc etc will be taken over by dr deepak so we know the nucleus diameter for example if we take a big brown nucleus the diameter is going to be around 9 mm and we know that the ccc or the when you do a continuous capsule rex is it's almost 170% stretchable so if we do a 6 mm capsule rexis we can deliver the largest nucleus which is like black cataract of almost 9 mm because it can pass through the ccc without damaging it so whenever you have a nucleus you can judge the diameter of the nucleus and you have to judge the proper size of ccc for example for very soft cataracts a grade 1 or 2 you can get away with even 5 mm ccc and you can prolapse it out but if it is a larger nucleus you have to go for a bigger ccc and if you have done by mistake a smaller ccc it is always better to either enlarge the ccc by giving a tangential nick and then enlarging ccc or give multiple tears at the margin so that the nucleus comes out without any resistance that is very important otherwise if you keep struggling with smaller ccc you will land up with zonular dialysis and that is more difficult to manage so the ccc diameter and the nucleus diameter you should always keep on thinking for each case whether it is adequate for that or not now we talked about the nucleus prolapse okay the basic idea concept of nucleus prolapse is there are two ways to prolapse it out of the bag one way is to push it in front so it is it can be best way done by either doing a hydro dissection so as i was mentioning if you are doing a very forceful hydro dissection it will lead to hydro prolapse of the nucleus but you should do it through the widest possible incision so better to make the tunnel and then do hydro prolapse with a uh, good force and uh, the nucleus will prolapse out you can also do visco uh, prolapse and second technique as i was mentioning this visco or hydro prolapse works for softer grade of cataract better but if you have harder grade of cataract you can also do pulling technique like you can pull the nucleus out of the bag by using any of the sinski dialer or uh, i use the ball tip dialer recently and it's very good so you can just have to what you have to do is you have to negotiate the equator of the nucleus so what i see my trainees or fellows struggling with is that they are afraid to go around the equator equator of the nucleus over here and uh, then they keep on struggling with rotation of the nucleus so important thing is to negotiate this equator of the nucleus then only you can pull it in the anterior chamber okay this is how it is to be done so reach beyond the equator next thing is pupil and uh, this is a very common mistake for the initial days where when you are you try keep on trying hydroprolapsing or nucleus rotation other thing and then the pupil becomes smaller because of these manipulations and still you try to prolapse it out through the small pupil i think it is best to you know sit back relax and apply some iris retractors here and just whenever my fellow comes and tells me that uh, you know this complication was because the pupil became small during the surgery i simply ask him why didn't you put any pupil expanders because that is the easiest way to do it and for uh, sics it is better to use iris retractors rather than pupil expansion devices because they get dislodged when you try to Uh, prolapse the nucleus out so it is best to use the iris sucs whenever needed don't you know postpone the uh, decision of uh, putting the iris sucs it works and it makes the job easier 
and this is what you call that astigmatic funnel when you make incision in this funnel you get the least amount of astigmatism i borrowed this slide from dr karan bhatia and he has a very excellent video on youtube i have also uh, written the link here so uh, he has uh, given all the steps in detail so do watch that video as well and this is the side view of the scleral tunnel and we must visualize this because once we get the three dimensional idea of the scleral tunnel it is easier to negotiate that tunnel when you are operating we have already discussed this and as i mentioned the straight is the easiest to start with and as you grow with experience you can go to frown and chevron incision avoid the smile incision because it is going to uh, give much higher astigmatism and you have to suture it always now again coming back to the delivery so one of the important concepts of sics is engagement of the nucleus it's so it's just like the delivery of fetus fetus engagement is very important part of uh, the delivery process so if it is not engaged we call it floating and these are the babies who are at high risk so for engaging the nucleus what the nucleus has to do is it has to go get into the scleral tunnel and i will show it in the video also what i call it as engagement if you are not getting this nucleus engaged into scleral tunnel in one attempt you should it it will it means that the nucleus size is larger than the inner tunnel size so you have to increase the inner tunnel size either or you can just uh, remove some cortex around the nucleus by using simco and then it might fit the scleral tunnel so it is important if the nucleus is not getting engaged easily in the scleral tunnel there is a mismatch between the size so don't keep on struggling with uh, nucleus uh, engagement just go ahead and enlarge the inner tunnel size now coming to the delivery of the nucleus okay so if the nucleus is not engaged basically what happens is that the nucleus goes under the tunnel so it is going into the angle you feel that it is going to come out but it will never come out because it is stuck over there and you keep on struggling to get this nucleus out causing more damage this is the engagement of the nucleus where it comes into the scleral tunnel and then once it is engaged you can simply push visco from the side port or you can push some fluid and do visco expression now for visco expression uh, the tunnel size has to be adequate so if it is even slightly smaller the visco expression will be very difficult to do so if the tunnel size is slightly smaller we can also do this is called as sandwich technique which dr deepak also does very commonly where you are holding the nucleus between two instruments one sinski dialer and one wire vectis and you are going to pull it out here you have to be careful that the wire vecti should not be holding iris by mistake because i have seen entire iris being pulled out if the surgeon is not aware of this and also the sinski has to be safely away from the endothelium to uh, damage to avoid any damage to the endothelium now the same thing we can do uh, without using second instrument also where the wire vectis is used this is just like visco expression but wire vectis is used to guide the nucleus into the scleral tunnel and then pushing the posterior uh, the posterior plane or the posterior lip you can take the uh, nucleus out you can do the same with irrigating wire vectis that means from the anterior part or distal part of the wire vectis there is fluid which is coming in the anterior chamber which will push the nucleus out now here i would like to highlight another important tip and a very common and very bad complication that most of the beginner surgeons do so what they don't understand is that wire vectis what you can see here i will show it again wire vectis is not a tool to grab the nucleus and pull it up okay that is the common mistake that i see my trainees do it is a tool to guide the nucleus into scleral tunnel so it is not something like a spoon where you are trying to you know scrape the nucleus or to pull the nucleus up what it what if you do that that is pull the nucleus up what it does is that as you can see here again 
okay it will rub against the endothelium and this will cause massive corneal edema or even corneal decompensation particularly if you are removing a harder grade of cataract so this is one particular thing which should not be done uh, by a surgeon because it is going to give very bad corneal edema so the movement of the wire vector should be something i will show again something like this posteriorly dipping it should be pressing the posterior lip and not the anterior movement or the pulling up movement should not be there with the wire vectis okay so uh, tips for starting the manual sics i think it is better to uh, many times what happens that uh, you start off with uh, doing feco and you are fairly good with feco but you want to learn sics because you want a technique to fall back upon in case you have a very difficult case and then you try doing manual sics but that is not the way to learn manual sics you should in fact first try and start doing manual sics in simpler cases like the softer grade of cataract there are two advantages one the sics itself is easy in this in these cases and second because you are already doing feco you can easily do feco in case something happens in your sics second thing most important thing to remember is that a case which is difficult for feco is also equally difficult for sics for a untrained surgeon so it is not so that there is a case which is difficult for feco and it's very easy for sics no sics will also have difficulties with that case because so you have to be very good surgeon sics surgeon for that so always start doing in simpler cases then only you can uh, do this technique in difficult cases and always start with the larger incision and uh, as uh, i will show again closer to the limbus and then as you become more experienced you start reducing the size of the incision so don't aim for 5.5 and 6 mm incision size go for 7 mm size and you can suture it initially once you are confident with your technique then you can go ahead with the smaller size of the incision also start with 1 mm from go to the 2 mm from the limbus now i will share one video of steps okay this has also audio with it so i think i will continue with the audio of the this particular video and uh, in between i will stop and share some additional tips as needed hello friends in this video i'll be speaking about sics the small incision cataract surgery tips and tricks so here is the first trick to take the superiorus bridle once you hold the superiorus the globe must turn down that is a indication that you are holding the superiorus otherwise you might just catch hold of the conjunctiva and uh, that bridle may not be of any use so this is how the superiorus bridle is taken it helps in rotating the globe downwards and also assist in stabilizing the globe now for peritomy there is no need of excessive peritomy which i certain times see that surgeons are doing just enough for the scleral tunnel do very mild cautery do not make the whole area white because we don't want excessive scarring later always measure where you want to start the scleral tunnel so for the beginners i recommend to take the make the scleral tunnel at 1.5 mm from the limbus so mark that point where the scleral tunnel will be closest to the limbus and then you can either take a straight incision or you can take a frown incision and that incision should be of 6 mm so i am again marking 6 mm so i am using here gentian valet pen just to demonstrate how i mark the scleral incision you can also use certain markers like uh, there is a sics marker which is available or you can simply measure like this now i am using a crescent blade to make a deep groove at this at the joining these three points the groove should be around 200 to 300 micron depth 
Once the groove is made, I very gently start dissecting the sclera. Making the incision at the right depth is the most important part. So go very slowly. See to it that the crescent is still seen through the sclera, but it should not be very clearly seen. That means you are at the right depth. Once you reach the right depth, then cross over the limbus. At this point, you should just make your crescent slightly anterior. So you go into the cornea slightly anteriorly to avoid any premature entry. Now here, watch very closely how I am dissecting the scleral tunnel. I am first going into the cornea because cornea has a good lamellar structure so we can maintain the plane better. And I cut into the sclera while coming out. So first the crescent blade goes into the cornea and while coming out it creates incision in the sclera. This avoids ragged incision which may lead to more astigmatism later. So these crescent movements are very important. So watch this video again and again and see how I am moving my crescent. And I am always following the curvature of the sclera. Here I am showing you the points where the scleral tunnel is placed. If you have noticed while making the tunnel, I also made some side pockets. So this is a 6 mm opening. Inside there is around 8 to 9 mm opening. And the tunnel is 1.5 mm away from the limbus. Also inside the cornea there is 1.5 mm breadth. So this is what I will recommend for the beginners. You can go ahead with 2 mm also but 1.5 mm is enough to start with. Now I am making the side port incision which has to be larger as compared to that we use in FECO because it has to accommodate the Simco cannula which is commonly used with SICS. It is important that you make a good large rexis. I already described the principles of making CCC using a cystitome in my another video. So I am using the same method and same steps to make that CCC. Now while entering make sure that you make this sideward movement to make sure that you are keratome is in right plane and you are not making another plane. Watch these movements again and again. Watch this video again and see how I am cutting while I am entering and not while I am coming out. That again makes the incision very regular and also see that the inside incision also I am making it parallel to the limbus. Once the entry is made I do hydro dissection from the main tunnel now we, we can use any instrument. I generally use a long Sinsky to lift the nucleus up but here I am using a ball tipped blunt chopper where I can negotiate the equator of the lens very easily and because it is a ball tipped chopper it is very very safe for the posterior capsule. You can also try using this instrument which makes bringing the nucleus into AC a very easy maneuver. So once one pole is out, I think it is very easy for to rotate the nucleus into the AC anterior chamber. Once the nucleus is out, we can just rotate it with visco cannula itself and keep pushing some visco over and under the nucleus. And now this is a very important part of the SICS. This is where good technique is required to protect the endothelium. Watch how I did it. First the nucleus gets engaged in the scleral tunnel and then I just press the posterior lip. Using the visco cannula you can use the wire vectis also and then if your scleral tunnel is of adequate length and it is well configured it comes out easily. Really. Now I want to show this uh, particular step in slow motion video. Just watch I am pushing some visco under the nucleus and the nucleus gets engaged into the scleral tunnel. So it is not over the iris but it is engaged in the scleral tunnel. So you have to carefully watch this particular step because this is the step where you can damage the endothelium. 
so just imagine the scleral tunnel as i have shown earlier and the nucleus is engaged into that scleral tunnel once it is engaged it's just matter of just pushing the posterior lip down that the nucleus comes out if the nucleus is large like like in cases of brown or black cataracts you can make the posterior incisions to the scleral incision and make it large on the outside also for the easy delivery of the nucleus which i can show in another video now most important thing is using simco for irrigation aspiration now it is a manual cortex aspiration method which is a low flow method unlike the coaxial uh, aspiration method which we use in, with our feco machine so here the principle is that you catch hold of the anterior part of the cortex and the beauty of this particular instrument is that once the occlusion is achieved it doesn't get released unless you push the fluid back which you don't do generally so once occlusion is achieved you just pull out that cortex that is how it should be done so do not try to aspirate the cortex inside the anterior chamber which makes fluctuation in the anterior chamber which i many times see when the uh, uh, some surgeons are operating that the ac keeps collapsing so there is no need to aspirate the cortex inside the eye just catch hold of the cortex very very gradually there is no need to do very rapid movements to remove the cortex in fact the movement should be very very slow so you uh, you know the cortex occludes the tip completely you can see here the occluding the cortex is occluding the tip and then you can just pull it out gently without much hurry and this way the simco cannula is makes it very safe so for the sub incisional cortical matter i am using the right side port so i think just watch these steps very carefully see how gentle i am while i am uh, removing the cortex there is no hurry still within a minute i can remove all the cortex very very easily you can also do the posterior capsular wash or hydration or just hydro displacement of the cortical fibers with your simco so the principle is that let cortex occlude the tip very gently and then you pull it out don't aspirate it inside this is the implantation of a pmma non foldable iol you can see the 6 mm optic just snugly fits into the incision indicating that my incision size is just 6 mm this is the method you just rotate the leading haptic in the back and now don't use the scleral tunnel but use the side port and use a simple sinski dialer first push the optic inside the back and then you rotate the haptic in the back so make it into three steps first putting the leading haptic in the back second push the optic in the back and the third push the haptic in the back do thorough wash of the anterior chamber because we are using a low flow system of simco so take your time to wash all the visco otherwise you will have increased intraocular pressure next day and just a little bit of bipolar cautery to close the conjunctiva so there is no need of any sutures so this is a small incision cataract surgery for you watch this video again and again and watch each and every step very very carefully i have explained most important thinking process behind each step and have a great result with this very nice surgical technique for removal of the cataract thank you so much thank you very much i think i have already exceeded the time so uh, i think uh, lipe question and answers can be taken later maybe so okay over to you <laughs> there are uh, two questions i believe uh, if you could answer it briefly but uh, dr mauro campos is uh, the the head of our sector uh, he's asking if uh, do you think that fixating the eye like superior rectus loop may facilitate nucleus expression i think he's referring to a superior rectus bridal uh, suture and yes. the second question is in cases of a very hard cataract would you perform a safety tunnel suture before the nucleus delivery to help manage uh uh supercoroid or explosive hemorrhage 
Okay, I think the first question, Super Rectus Bridal helps in fixing the globe uh, very well. So, uh, at least in initial cases, I think it is better to use it. Uh, myself, I have used it for demonstration purpose, but if I have to do it, I generally don't use the bridal because I can hold the sclera with my left hand instrument and do most of the, uh, the uh, this thing, technique. But of course, it is better, easier if you can fixate the globe with Super Rectus. And uh, in case of very hard cataract, uh, whether it's suture. Uh, so unlike ECC, here we are doing a self-sealing incision. When you have a good scleral tunnel, what self-sealing means is that when the intraocular pressure increases, it is going to seal itself. So uh, that itself is a protection against expulsive hemorrhage. Because in expulsive hemorrhage, what we want is that even if there is increased pressure from inside, it should not open up the incision. So that way, I think SICS is much safer and you do not need uh, to do a suture unlike ECC, where if there is increased intraocular pressure, the incision is going to open up. Thank you, Dr. Surab, for your excellent presentation and also the very uh, instructive video as well. I will move on to the next uh, talk. Um, that's Dr. Uh, Deepak Megur. I Thank you for your participation. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Deepak. And he's also a brilliant uh, Indian colleague. He has already been with us before in this meeting on April. Uh, and it's once again an honor to have you here with us. Uh, he uh, is also an excellent surgeon that is also part of this uh, group. And I'd like later, so Dr. Surab and Dr. Deepak can comment on the FACO training uh, website as well. So Dr. Deepak, if you can share your, your screen, thanks once again for being in this meeting. Yeah, uh, thank you for the invite and it's a pleasure to again join you again for the meeting. And uh, uh, let me start by sharing you, uh, my start my first case here. Uh, as Saurav uh, elegantly explained to you about the basic steps, I think uh, uh, the world over, I think every surgeon, every FACO surgeon needs to master the art of SICS. Uh, the reason I'll explain it to you now, because uh, it's an excellent bailout technique. You have a complication in, in FACO and you want to convert. Instead of converting to ECC, if you can convert to FACO emulsification, SICS, uh, the visual outcome recovery period is significantly lesser. The surgery becomes much more faster so that was going to be my first case. Uh, this is a case where uh, I'm struggling with my FACO emulsification. It's a Morgagnian hard cataract. And I'm inducing undue stress on the bag. And uh, uh, things don't go the way as they're supposed to go in. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, you know, clue which shows to me that something is wrong here. The nucleus is tilting here. And diagnosing a post-capsule tear overlying, with an overlying nucleus is going to be extremely difficult here. When you have a tilted nucleus, you need to be very highly suspicious. I inject viscoelastic and then manipulate the nucleus and then see, I can see extremely large uh, PC tear, which is the one of the edges just seen. I don't see the other edge at all. And I have an entire big nucleus still there. And uh, so immediately my plan is to convert to SICS. I'm sitting temporarily here uh, under topical anesthesia. I move to superiorly and I'm now making a conjunctal peritomy, I'm doing a posterior subtenance uh, uh, a block uh, using uh, just one ml of lidocaine under the tenons now because it's topical. You can see the lens is already decentered here. Uh, so now, now is the time to create your, uh, your scleral tunnel. You have an opportunity to clear a perfect uh, scleral tunnel here. And in spite of having a side port, you can see a side port here. I can still create a side, uh, the tunnel underneath the side port here. So there are two different planes here. So you are creating a 6.5 millimeter or a 7 millimeter tunnel here. And you, it's important that you should have an inner corneal valve. That valve is extremely critical because that is what you want to be uh, aware of. And uh, the, luckily for me in this case, the rexus was of adequate size. So the manipulating the nucleus uh, out of the bag was not such a difficult entity. And the first thing you do is always, you know, obviously there is a vitreous disturbance. The first thing you want to do before anything else is deal with the vitreous. 
So what I'm doing, I want to convert this into a totally closed chamber. I'm closing off the, the scleral tunnel, which I've created here. Again, I shift temporarily and start doing my bimanual vitrectomy using the two uh, side port incisions. So just a limited bimanual enter vitrectomy is done here uh, to take care of all the vitreous here. And uh, once it is done, uh, I have a smaller pupil. The pupil has become a little bit small, small uh, because I want a larger pupil because I want to see my rexus edge so that I can place the intraocular lens. Intracameral adrenaline just comes uh, handy for me. The pupil again dilates for me luckily so that now I can see the uh, rexus edge uh, quite clearly here. Uh, now I'm again, uh, the case becomes a routine when once you're taking care of the vitreous, uh, this is a, a multi-piece hydrophobic lens. I'm just manipulating the lens over the sulcus. A patient did have a pre-existing uh, against the rule uh, cylinder. So to counter that, I'm using a single radial stitch here to close the superior incision. Again, I'm closing the conjunctiva. I've not used any cautery for the uh, wound here. Uh, and uh, uh, remove the viscoelastic, which is gone behind. And this is a very stressful situation. You, the, you, the nucleus was almost about to dive in, and you had a large PC tear. And uh, if you have a perfect plan B, and if you're very well versed with the technique of SICS, uh, in these uh, cases, in these uh, complex situations, you know, uh, you learning the or mastering the art of SICS really is going to help you out. Of course, I'm trying to lock the lens into the uh, uh, the capsule here and the pupil is brought down using pilocarpine. Uh, the message here is when you have a situation where you would want to convert, the visual outcome following this complication, if you convert it, are almost indistinguishable, both the, the way to look at it and the, the, the post-operative visual outcome, because the amount of induced stigmatism is very less here. This is the temporal incision, which are closed with the tenno vitreal here. And uh, I've used a superior tenno nylon suture for this. So it takes care of the against the rule stigmatism, which is induced by this thing. And by four days post-op, you know, the results will be almost be indistinguishable from a routine one. Although we did convert FACO from FACO to extremely uh, large incision, of course, uh, peripheral retinal evaluation is mandatory to say. So, <clears throat> so that was my first case. Now moving on to the next case. So this is one of the important reasons why any, every FACO surgeon needs to master SICS because the results, uh, the uh, intraoperative surgical time is significantly reduced and the visual outcome is much more uh, faster. So that is the reason why I think I would always uh, recommend this, uh, uh, this technique to be learned by every FACO surgeon. In India, almost most of, us, most of the training happens like uh, we first learn SICS and then graduate to FACO Masterpiece. That is a protocol which we have here. So I think that's a significant advantage which we have. So whenever we encounter a complication, we are very well versed to just convert it into this thing. Moving on to a next case here. Now, this is a 98 year old lady and uh, we have pseudo exfoliation. We have shallow anterior chamber, poor corneal health, uh, moderately dilating pupil. And you can see the anterior chamber is hardly anything. So the priorities in this case would be you're not bothered about your uh, surgical induced astigmatism. We want to protect the endothelium. The risk of desmates membrane detachment is extremely high in these cases, as is the case of uh, zonular weakness. So we need to be aware of these things when you're trying to plan the surgery in this case. So our priority is to protect the endothelium. So one thing is you need to make a slightly larger incision. Use the best OVD which you can afford so that, you know, that the endothelium is safeguarded. So one trick I'd like to share here is, you know, I have, uh, 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 I have just uh, supporting my, this thing, uh, the stabilize the globe using a posterior scleral incision. I'm not using any other instrument. Make a small groove on the posterior to the main incision and stabilizing it. And then I'm creating my tunnel. And I'm using the soft shell technique, uh, immaterial of what uh, uh, technique you use. If you can afford a viscoat and uh, sodium hyaluronate or HPMC, it would be great in such complex size where you know, endothelium is priceless. So I want to uh, make a perfect spheroid tunnel. And the idea is I don't want the nucleus to get stuck in the wound, you know, I, I, because I realize that endothelium is extremely priceless. So I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm trying to create a valvular incision, which is much more bigger inside as Saurabh demonstrated here. 
than outside and also having a little bit of a frown incision. A second important thing is because we have a smaller pupil, uh, ensure that you have an adequately sized uh, CCC. There are two obstructions for the nucleus maneuvering. One is obviously uh, the pupil and the second is the rexus. So you have to be aware of these two restrictions which you have when you're trying to manipulate the nucleus out of the back. Hydro dissection is extremely critical here because we want to be totally sure that the nucleus in the cortex are totally devoid of its attachment with the bag before trying to manipulate here. I'm using a bimanual technique of maneuvering the nucleus out. I think this technique has to be mastered. You're using two Sinsky hooks to engage the equator of the nucleus and then pulling it out. It's just like, you know, uh, the puncture tire is just wheeled out. It's called a wheeling out technique out of the bag. If you can master this technique of wheeling the nucleus out of the bag, you can bring the nucleus out in an eyes where the zodules are compromised. And this is my standard technique of nucleus delivery. I'm using the FACO sandwich technique here. The uh, vectus is behind, the dialer is above it. The dialer presses the nucleus down, whereas the vectus just holds it up. And then under the cover of viscoelastic, uh, the nucleus is expressed out. Uh, as you can see here, I'm just trying to pull it. Uh, in spite of having planned everything well, still, you know, you can see the nucleus is slightly stuck here. So the one tip here would be avoid pushing the nucleus back inside. So however tempting it may sound, always use the side port, form the antechamber with a little bit of viscoelastic. I'm using a Sinsky hook and stabilizing the sclera using a forceps here. And then again, it is uh, using the dialer and holding the equator of the nucleus. It is gently maneuvered out. The epinucleus is just irrigated and washed out. And then the next of the case is simple. So you have to be uh, aware of the complexity of the cases and then plan accordingly. So this was a case where the patient was extremely elderly we had a pseudo exfoliation, uh, moderately dilating pupil. Uh, but if you have planned it well and anticipated the complication, uh, complications or difficulties in surgeries, the visual outcomes are going to be quite good here. Of course, as the point was made here, that uh, it is not important that you know which technique is better. It's we need to understand that which uh, technique the surgeon is comfortable with. So it's not a debate of which this technique or that technique. I think it depends upon uh, our individual uh, uh, comfort level of this, but the principles are always going to remain the same. Now, moving on to the uh, next case here. So next complex case, uh, I'll just quickly go and show. Okay, this is another similar case here. So uh, <clears throat> This is again an elderly male patient, pseudo exfoliation and quite a, a bad cornea he had. And uh, I'll just forward it a little bit. I usually avoid a cautery. I stabilize the sclera using a small scleral groove which I've created here. My assistant always irrigates the uh, incision so that the bleeding is, uh, my visibility is not hampered here. So I'm making a slightly frown incision. It's about one and a half millimeter behind the limbus, this incision. And uh, so I'm just trying to show you the uh, technique here. You have to see the, uh, the, the scleral tunnel being performed here. And uh, I always don't do the entire tunnel initially because I want to uh, use viscoelastic to just tighten up the globe a little bit. Uh, here I'm just staining it and then let me forward this a little bit. And once you can see this the entire lip is there, this is the point where you want to make an internal entry. So you have, a, this is what we call as the valve. This valve is going to prevent uh, uh, the sliding of the wound. And this is what is responsible for the self sealing nature. The bag is extremely loose. As I'm trying to puncture, you can see the entire bag is wobbly. And uh, usually in eyes with loose zonules, I always go back and try to use my forceps. The forceps is definitely much more, uh, gives better control when trying to deal with eyes with these uh, loose zonules. So again, you know, sizing the rexus is extremely critical because when you're trying to maneuver the nucleus out, uh, the chances of having an intercapsule extraction is very high. 
in these eyes with Luzonius. So by having a size which is quite adequate here, but I need to anticipate that the, uh, the nucleus is going to be still very bulky. So uh, now is the time I'm going to enlarge my incision. The tunnel has already been created. I'm going to enlarge my incision. Uh, again, it, the inner lip always has to be parallel to the limbus when you extend so that you don't lose the valvular nature of the uh, incision throughout. So this is inches about, extend would be about six and a half to seven. You can see the bag is moving when I'm trying to move it. So at this stage, you cannot prolapse the nucleus. We need to understand that. So when the bag is moving along with the nucleus, it's going to have an intracapsular surgery. So I'm trying to uh, I do a little bit of hydro dissection, try to separate the nucleus from uh, the bag here, and probably the hydro dissection is probably the most important step in such situations. You want the nucleus and cortex complex to be free from the entire bag here. So once it's there, now I'm do, I want to introduce my CTR at the earliest because I want to provide an equatorial stretch to the bag before manipulating the nucleus out. You know, the, uh, I'm creating some space by using sodium oil uh, sodium halonate to create some space here. And this is where my CTR is going to go inside. So I've created some space here uh, using a, a sodium halonate here. And then uh, the CTR is threaded. So this is obviously going to the same way as we do it in our FACO. But we need to understand that this has to be done beforehand uh, because I want to have an equatorial stretch to the capsular bag before the nucleus is mobilized out of it. So uh, the... Uh, I usually prefer the bimanual way of uh, putting the CTR into the bag here. So once it is done, uh, again, I just ensure that the nucleus is free from the uh, free from its attachment to it. Again, a little bit of viscoelastic, it goes inside. And the real challenge is the surgery. This is the step. You want to bring the nucleus out without disturbing the bag. The bag has to be there. So saving the bag is a challenge. Again, a bimanual technique. With one hand, I'm pushing the nucleus down. Second, engages the equator of it. And both the Sinskyuks are now engaging the equator of the nucleus. Now it is tipped up. And this is where you use the wheeling technique. Uh, the bag is prevented from coming out because we've already used the CTR. And now using this uh, technique, the entire nucleus is prolapsed out of the bag. And this is once this is done, the, the nucleus delivery is going to be, again, a simple thing. You already created a nucleus thing and everything. In this case, the most significant aspect of the surgery was to ensure that the bag was saved until the nucleus was prolapsed out into the uh, anterior chamber. So prolapsing the nucleus out of the bag into the anterior chamber is a key step. And I believe learning this bimanual technique is a good way because it really helps us in these challenging cases. So let me move on to my uh, next case. So this is again a case where we have, uh, 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 this is a, a LIG, a FACO lytic glaucoma a patient is uh, having a pseudo exfoliation, non dilating pupil, so multiple complexities apart from the, uh, the LIG itself. So again, you're going to perform a scleral tunnel here. When I'm trying to puncture the anterior capsule, you can see there are folds in the anterior capsule indicating that uh, the zonules are extremely weak here. And uh, of course, you have to deal with the fluid also, which comes out here. So uh, you irrigate, and there are multiple challenges here. I have to have a bigger excess, but the pupil is small. And that's the reason why I might not be able to get an adequately sized rexus. Uh, to add to the fact that extreme zonular weakness uh, uh, makes my rexus to be extremely small here. So I have got multiple uh, problems here uh, because I need to enlarge the rexus before bringing the nucleus out. Otherwise, the, it's going to be an intracapsular extraction. So to increase the size of the rexus, first I need to deal with the pupil. So uh, these, uh, you can't bring the nucleus out unless or until uh, the rexus is enlarged. And for that, I need to see well. Uh, probably this step, I thought I'll get away uh, by putting the CTR itself first here. I'm trying to put in a CTR here. 
uh, my visibility is very bad. I'm just a little bit reluctant to uh, use the extra step of trying to, you know, uh, put in a, a iris soak. And my, because I might go into the sulcus rather than into the bag here. So I'm trying to negotiate the uh, ring uh, into the bag. It's not a, it's a, it was not a good idea for me. I should have used iris hook straight away. So I'm trying to retract it using my uh, Sinsky hook uh, and then manipulating the uh, ring into the bag. Uh, luckily, the second time I was confident that the ring could be managed to be placed into the bag here. The whole exercise, you know, uh, people is still small. So I, my idea was to avoid iris hooks, but uh, I now some wisdom really dawned into me. So now I'm using these uh, capsule hooks instead of iris hooks because I thought I can use this also to support the bag if the need arises. These capsule hooks are slightly bigger. So uh, although I wanted to do the surgery without using this uh, uh, extra step, but eventually I had to give in. So once once you are able to see well, I'm and the ring has already gone in. Because the ring has gone in, it is giving me a stretch and the rexus, even though some of them it is calcified, it, I could easily tear because the zonulus, uh, the tensile strength of zonules has come back. And now, using the two instruments, I'm able to maneuver the nucleus out. So nucleus is still quite uh, big enough. It's not very small. Uh, the mistake which I did was I had to use the capsule hooks at the beginning itself. And you can see the dye has all percolated behind the uh, uh, the lens into the vitreous cavity, giving the blue glow through the transzonular uh, uh, opening, whatever we have here. So once we're able to see well, it becomes a child's play. Uh, the lesson here would be like, you know, uh, do not hesitate to use this expansion devices uh, like uh, the uh, iris hooks or the capsule hooks at the first instance itself in this case. Uh, however skilled you may be, they make things life a little bit more easier. And uh, this is how the eye was looking uh, the post-operatively. Uh, do you have some cordial edema over a period of time? It just clears off and uh, in, eventually the patient did quite well. Uh, I think uh, the, I'm running out of time. I think we'll have some discussion. So I, I had another case to show, but just because we are running out of time, we can stop here and we can have some discussion. I'd like to ask from our participants and also from uh, if you have any any comments or any techniques, because I think uh, most of us are not, uh, I, I speak for the Brazilian uh, part, <laughs> and most of us are not used to uh, doing SICS. And I think we have learned uh, pretty much today how to make uh, smaller incisions because your uh, ECC is still the, the the standard of care in terms of delivering uh, hard nuclei or when you are about to convert from FACO to another uh, technique. So that's one point I'd like to point out. And also, if we have some minutes, I'd like to comment on the on your initiative on facotraining.org.in. Uh, if you can uh, show some some aspects and explain uh, why did you uh, resolve to make it happen? Like uh, we have many platforms today, but I think what you are doing is really special because you can uh, divide by, by themes and it's easier to navigate and find uh, the videos you are looking for. Uh, we have a, a question here from Dr. Neto. He has that before. Uh, do you uh, do SICS under topical anesthesia is one uh, question. And the other one from Rodolfo Bonacci is how is uh, the learning curve M uh, SICS? Uh, we have discussed it before, but if you could uh, comment on that again, I'd gladly thank you. Um, Dr. Nito, I think SICS in very simple cases, it can be done, uh, but I still prefer to do a small subconjunctival infiltration where you're, I'm doing my scleral tunnel. So everything is done under topical, but when I do that, I just give a small, uh, you know, 0.5 ml or less than that uh, using a 30 gauge needle to raise the blep. 
because the, when you touch the conjunctiva and do the spiral tunnel part, that is slightly painful. So that is the part where I would like to use a subconjunctal infiltration, and then you are going to use intracameral anesthesia. Uh, in the case of a slightly prolonged surgery, you can use the same conjunctival flap to give us a posterior subtendinous block and then proceed with the surgery. And regarding uh, uh, what is the learning curve, uh, I think a surgeon who has uh, mastered ECC, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, the only two key steps, the most difficult step for a beginner is always going to be creating that self-sealing sclerocorneal valve incision. That is going to be the real challenge because Rexis, I'm sure most of us are in are quite good at it now. The real challenge is always going to be learning that uh, sclerocorneal tunnel and creating that valve. Uh, I think you can learn it faster in wet lab and then graduate to uh, in, uh, your life surgeries as well. Uh, but if you can do ECC well, you can always learn uh, ma manual spongy cataract surgery. It's no big deal at all. And uh, also, congratulations for the the such an for the ease of implantation of a CTR in such a difficult case because that bag was really loose and uh, it's it's it makes it look like magic as well, Doctor Sura. Yeah. Uh... First of all, uh, thank you very much. And a uh, little bit of uh, about our uh, this new website, fecotraining.org.in. And uh, the main idea behind the website was to, as you rightly said, uh, to have a good categorized video. So anyone who wants to look for a particular thing can get it easily. And uh, apart from that, of course, we are inviting guest videos also. Uh, we want uh, a lot of surgeons to contribute. Uh, not just experienced surgeons, but also young surgeons, fellows, residents. So they can contribute their own videos. So we can review those videos. We can learn from them. We can also explain them what can be done better. So all these, uh, uh, these things. Then we have also taken webinar. We are planning to have videos of the month section where we'll be uh, taking two or three good videos, submissions of that month. And we'll be talking with the uh, the contributors uh, about what they were thinking for during that surgery and what could have been done differently, something like that. And we'll be also reviewing some uh, new technology or new products that might be coming and uh, so that we can give more insights into how you can use them, you know, in a better way. Uh, the mistakes which uh, can be avoided while using uh, the new technology and iOS and various devices. So that's the central theme, uh, and Deepak also can contribute a few things about that. Yeah, I think we are, uh, the aim is to teach, you know. I think the whole idea of starting this uh, platform is to teach, uh, because I think, you know, surgery is not in hand. It is up here in the mind, the way you think. Uh, this is the difference which you would want. Basically, you know, uh, uh, as we learn, we forget that how we had learned, actually. So actually, the whole idea of... Uh, uh, Surgery would be how to alter your thinking process because surgery is more about thinking and planning and then executing. That is what we would like to focus on. That is what our surgical videos are also focused on. They're not just not, uh, you know, just showing our videos. We want to explain why we did particular step and what was the idea behind that. And that is the reason why we have done this. Uh, and that is on, the only aim of this is to teach. And uh, I think we have a lot of questions here. Dr. Richard is raising his hand from some time. I think he would want to ask a question. Dr. Sarah bin Deepak, are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You're here, audible. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Um, my question is regarding the OVD. What kind of OVD you use? And uh, the second question is about the uh, astigmatism. How um, controllable is the astigmatism? What, what, what's the goal? Um, astigmatism, do you target astigmatism on the post-op? Uh, that you aim on a uh, one month post op? So, uh, the thing is, you know, uh, the uh, level amount of astigmatism uh, induced is dependent upon many factors. Uh, the most important factor is the way we construct the, uh, the surgical, uh, the scleral tunnel. And it goes, uh, it reduces over a period of time as the experience of the surgeon increases. Uh, because you have to understand that it is an art. This creating the surgical tunnel is an art. 
as saurabh very clearly mentioned initially you are bothered about having an uneventful surgery you can err on slightly bigger side but as you uh, learn and master the incision size keeps on reducing uh, without having any complications mind you that is the first goal apart from that the fa- apart from the incision size which is very obvious other factors which play which go into uh, play a role here would be uh, how, what cautery you are using how much cautery you are using and how much you are uh, the tissue handling uh, the tissue handling has to be very gentle the way you handle the tissue is going to induce inflammation inflammation is going to induce scarring and that's going to add on to your overall astigmatism surgical induced astigmatism so each surgeon is going to have his own surgical induced astigmatism but needless to say with experience it comes down uh, apart from the size these are all the factors which come into play regarding a typical you know 5 and 1/2 to 6 mm you need a superior incision you can expect about minus 0.75 to minus 1.25 cylinder uh, against the astigmatism in most surgical hands anywhere between minus 0.5 to minus 1.25 uh, this is what we can expect in most uh, uh, cases uh, unless and until you are dealing with an extremely large and case or a um, large nucleus or a complicated cases so this is how it is going to be and uh, <clears throat> i would like to add one just like uh, feco where you tend to take a incision on a steeper axis it's a good idea even for sics like we have many old patients who have significant against the rule astigmatism and if you can do a temporal small incision cataract surgery in those patients i think they will benefit more from the reduction of astigmatism also and also in cases where the patient is going to subsequently maybe need a trabeclectomy surgery so you want to preserve the superior conjunctiva for that so for that you can also consider a temporal uh, uh, manual sics also one more thing i would like to ask uh, as you may know in brazil we have this culture of uh, ecc and uh, recently in some schools we don't even uh, teach ecc anymore and go they go directly to fake homosification i i really love i i did a lot of eccs and i really lo- love to teach them cuz uh, as as doctor said uh, it's important for managing any complications and uh, what in, in the learning curve for the res- residents in um what phase uh, do you think it's uh, ideal for the residents to learn uh sis SI, sics Uh, and do you think uh, they should also learn ecc also uh, i think you know uh, in india i think we are directly starting with sics but in brazil i think once you are comfortable the resident is comfortable with ecc i think maybe maybe 100 cases or 150 cases as soon as is comfortable i think they should transit directly to sics uh, we need to learn one backup technique i don't think uh, any surgeon can directly learn feco because there are always going to be complications and we need to convert and if you don't know how to suture then how are we going to convert and suturing is going to be the biggest challenging for our young surgeons because they learn fake emulsification and when you extend and do ecc and you don't know how to suture and do it neatly so it's going to be a problem so you we always want to have a way out first in learning any technique and ecc i think it's a nice thing and SICS I think is the way to go uh, Brazil you should all concentrate on learning SICS I think for training the residents uh, regarding who decides what surgery to start with it is the mentor so if the mentor or the consultant or the trainer himself is uh, you know uh, well trained in SICS then he will prefer to train his students in SICS because uh, remember training uh, you know includes lot of complications so the trainer should be you know confident of managing those complications if he is confident then only he can train his fellows for a particular technique as we know that uh, for feco the major complication is related to vitreo retina so if there is uh, say pc rain there is a drop or something any resident can just suture the wound and vitreo retina fellow can take over 
but for SICS, there are incision related complications, there are iris related complications, and for this, uh, you need uh, you know to be experienced. So I think the major uh, drawback, like uh, Deepak said, every institute in India will also have different ways. Like where I learned, there was no SICS, there was only ECC and FECO because my teachers uh, were not doing SICS. So I learned SICS later. But uh, rightly pointed out by uh, Dr. Deepak, if you are well versed with ECC, doing SICS is not that tough. Okay, I think I we I uh, could not show that in my presentation. If uh, you have you are doing uh, you have done a scleral tunnel and then you are having difficulty in nucleus delivery or prolapse or something like that, you can convert that to an extra capsular by giving to radial nicks at the end of the scleral tunnel. Okay, and you can deliver it just like ECC. So I think that can be a fallback technique in case you get stuck with. Uh, so if you are doing good ECC, if your teacher is uh, you know well versed with ECC, learn that, and then you can start learning SICS. Or come and visit India. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. It was, it was wonderful to have you here. I hope you can come to Brazil someday to teach our residents and. And take some of our residents to you to your institution to teach them also. Thank you very much. Definitely, definitely. I am anyway going to visit Dr. Nito <laughs> to see how he does a, a FACO faster than even SICS. Uh, I have one last question that's uh, originated from uh, Max uh, here on the chat. Uh, do you have any experience or tips on FACO section or FACO fracture in SICS? I myself have done uh, some uh, pre-slice uh, previously uh, in some cases, so I can reduce the, the incision uh, size, but uh, do you usually do anything like that? Uh, I think uh, what we are going towards is uh, we are doing mainly FACO surgeries for all our patients. Uh, you know, uh, most of the surgeons here will agree that maybe 99% uh, of our surgeries are FACO and uh, we are using SICS only for difficult cases. So if the surgeon really wants to do volume surgeries in SICS, I think he should learn this uh, FACO section technique because it is definitely going to help the patient in reducing the astigmatism because uh, with SICS, the major problem which I face uh, post-operatively is the unpredictable astigmatism that some patients may have because of a wrongly created tunnel and larger the tunnel more will the astigmatism so if you can section the nucleus inside the eye and take it out say through 4 4.5 millimeter tunnel it's going to uh, give much better refractive outcome definitely so but for that you should have uh, you should have the plan to do you know volume small incision cataract surgeries uh, actually, I started off by doing uh, a FACO section when way back about, say, uh, it, it was a very big thing in India before, before FACO really caught up, you know, when we all started doing SICS, uh, FACO section was a big thing. We all started doing FACO sections and we have done, but over a period of time, we all shifted to FACO emulsification. So 99% uh, of most of cases are FACO emulsification. So uh, most of the surgeons have migrated from SICS to FACO now. Very few surgeons are doing exclusive SICS, but they're still doing FACO section. So I have done uh, FACO section using a uh, vectus and a chopper, uh, using and uh, we the snare, we used to call a snare. What you have a my loop is actually a snare which was designed for SICS. The size which is man, which is marketing me loop, it's actually a snare which are used for doing SICS. We all use that. But now we have just moved on and migrated to fake emulsification. So it's a dying art now. Very few surgeons who are still doing SICS only are still doing uh, FACO section. If you don't have access to fake emulsification, I really FACO section uh, is a wonderful technique and it, it, it gives almost results similar to that of fake emulsification. Thank you. Uh, I'll move to final remarks now uh, for our uh, guests. And I thank once again for the participation. Uh, so if you want to comment, brief comments, Dr. Neto and also Dr. Surab and Dr. Deepak. 
Uh, well, I can't tell how much happy I am to have our dear friends from India. And uh, it's uh, there were two amazing presentations that, as I said, took our knowledge and understanding of SICX to another level. And we, it's very important, I think, to call attention to this surgery, which is not a lesser surgery, but uh, uh, another excellent uh, weapon, let's say like that, that we must have in our armamentarium of surgery. So thank you both of you for this magnificent time we had together. And I hope you have, uh, we have you here in the future. I think we should. I think Felipe is, uh, I, I, well, I, I, it, it would be very nice to discuss a little more about converting surgeries, converting fecal surgeries to SICX, uh, SICS and uh, ECC. So I think Felipe will have to arrange another meeting. <laughs> the, the invite is already made. So you can consider <laughs> Dr. Deepak and Dr. Sirab if you want to close, closing remarks as well. Okay. Uh, I think regarding SICS, I think one more important point, uh, it's one part of the SICS is scleral tunnel making, and I think it has multiple uses. For example, if you want to explant an IOL, uh, like a PMMA IOL from the eye, or even a foldable IOL from the eye, and you are not good at uh, cutting the IOL, you can always make a scleral tunnel and take it out. Okay, you can use the same for a dropped IOL for various other techniques, even simple making of flaps. You know, if you are good in uh, SICS, you can make these scleral uh, tunnels anywhere very easily. Even it's good for retina surgeons where we make scleral pockets for various things. So, I think for all FACO surgeons, uh, once in a while, try doing manual SICS, you know, in simpler cases, so that you get used to the idea of uh, making the scleral tunnel and it will help you in uh, different surgeries, even for trabeclectomy. I learned trabeclectomy after I learned SICS because now it's very easy. Only thing you have to make a shorter tunnel and cut. So uh, I think it's a useful technique uh, and you should dedicate uh, at least a couple of cases every month for doing a manual SICS uh, where you can always fall back upon to your regular technique of FACO so you can learn over a period of time. I think that's the message I would like to give. Uh, uh, I just like to close by saying I just cannot imagine like uh, how SICS cannot be learned or cannot be done because it's a way of life in India. We just can't imagine like SICS. Uh, it is like, you know, your bread and butter here. You can't live without that. It's just as uh, uh, we Indians find it very difficult that the rest of the world is finding, still trying to come in terms with doing this. Uh, it's a no brainer. I think every surgeon should learn it. You know, there's no question about, you know, having it. Uh, imagine you're uh, doing a nine millimeter surgery and putting three sutures or five sutures. Imagine you're just finishing surgery in just six millimeter. In a complex case, I'm telling you, when you're trying to convert, uh, obviously, FACO is going to stay here. I'm not arguing that SICS is, is an alternative to FACO. It's an excellent parachute to have when your life is at risk, you know, wear that parachute and jump, you know, it is the most safest parachute to have. And how can you fly without a parachute? I think it's extremely important for us to learn and get used to this parachute. So that's, what, that's my message here. So start uh, reading and learning. We'll post more videos on SICS definitely in our channels and our, our website. And hopefully it will be motivating for you. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you, uh, all our attendees and also our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, and I wish you a nice week and a nice weekend. Um, and for next week, stay tuned. We'll be talking again about FACO, but this time going to <laughs> femtosecond laser assisted surgery. So I thank you all once again and have a nice weekend. Thank you.